thank you so much, and it's, a, it's an honor to be here and to meet each of you. Uh, people that I've met before, it's a, it brings joy to my heart to, to come again to this community. And to the new people that I meet, uh, it is, it is a, an honor to, to be here. It's particularly important for me to hear your words, sir, because um, the tribe I work for, uh, no one speaks the language fluently anymore. And it's incredibly sad to, to not hear those words. <laughs> it, uh, it, it filled me with joy. Thank you. Um, even in a language I don't understand and to hear the translated message, it's one of the things that gives me hope. One of the reasons I work with Aboriginal people in my community is I believe that their core values are the values that will allow all of our societies and communities to survive. As you all know, we're on hard times. Um, when New York City is flooded, uh, when the largest cyclone in history hit the coast of India, uh, when the ice is melting in the North Country, everybody knows we have to change. But it's those core values of, of the native people of this land that I have confidence and hope in. And so I, I, I will do everything I can to, to uh, make sure that those values live and survive and prosper because they're the only way we're going to see a future. So I, I thank you for, for preserving those values and bringing them to us today. Hi, Scott. Um, I'm going to tell you a story about my journey with this. And this is kind of my effort to do consultation. <laughs> As a white person that, that is involved in this and, and my country involved in this, I feel an obligation. Uh, I am not disappointed by the turnout today at all because in fact, it's always just a few people that make the difference. It's never the 500 that do anything. It's the two or three or four or five people that come together, really understand something and decide to change. That's the way it always works, everywhere. It's the way always, everywhere, change happens. So I want to invite you in, and I will do my very best to, to tell you what I've learned. Um, one thing I've learned that is that Native culture is very powerful. Jewel James is a, not a relative, a member of the Lummi tribe and a, and a, and a, and a carver. And as, as Native people look around, it, uh, the, the Lummi and the Nooksack are very humble because the, the Haida and the Tlingit and many other famous tribes are, are, are master carvers. Uh, but Jewel James has worked very hard and he's been inspired, I think, by, by vision. So Jewel made this totem pole, very, very well done piece. And he made it as a gift. And he didn't just make it as a gift and take it and give it. He started where this coal is dug out of the ground with the Cheyenne people. And he went there and met with the Cheyenne and they celebrated. And they, each person spoke the truth that they knew. Um, and then he took the totem pole to every single community along the route where this coal will come to. And, in the, and took it to my community next to the last and, and uh, the oldest and one of the largest communities that's now gone along the coast near, near Bellingham in Washington where I live. But the final resting place for the totem pole was to give it as a gift to the tribe in North Vancouver because it really didn't belong in Washington because that wasn't the end of the trip. The end of, the, the end of, the end of this coal's route uh, will be in Canada often and is now. There's currently Powder River coal coming to, to West Shore Terminal and being shipped out. Um, I, I take that to be a very powerful act and a very much an act that brings people together, gives them an opportunity to share their wisdom and, and to begin to take action. So I have tremendous respect. And to me, it's a manifestation of that power of the core values that I mentioned at the beginning and that you mentioned in your, in your opening prayer. Um, some people see this as, a, as this is as big as it is. It goes from Fraser Surrey Docks to Texada. And that's one piece of reality. Um, the thing that I think is important about this is that the protections being offered to the people in the Delta area are very different than the protections that are being offered to you. 
and you need to know that, that there they were going to store the stuff outside and the community said, nope. Now the plan is to not have any storage capacity outside. They'll bring these trains in, they'll empty them inside of a building, load them on the barge, all covered, all inside. That's not what's going to happen on Texada. They're going to build 60 foot tall piles of coal and they're going to try to keep it on site by spraying water all over it. Now, water is our friend in many ways. It'll keep it from getting airborne, perhaps, although there are plenty of examples where the water systems don't work so well. But once it gets the water, uh, coal is going to be, and, and the very fine dust is going to be washed into the water system. And as you know, Lafarge already, uh, the jurisdictional health officer here, already has lodged a complaint with them about the impacts on water quality on Texade Island already. And it's a problem that's been known for I think three or four years and there's been no action taken to clean that up. That's a very bad precedent. That's not the story you want to hear. Uh, that, that they've known there's a problem and they haven't acted to rectify it. Um, so the story is bigger than just this though and, I, I, and, I, and I'm going to talk about a few things that, that aren't your problem immediately. They won't directly impact you but I want you to know about it because people need to know about the whole story. If we just protect our little place, if I stayed at home and pushed it out of my community, I would have pushed it into your community. And that's not right. The first talk I gave about this at all two years ago was in Billings, Montana. And I spent uh, days of my time coming, coming to BC. I spent, I think this is my 10th talk in British Columbia. If we just push it out of our community into other communities and don't understand the bigger picture, I think we're much, much weaker. So be patient with me when I explain some things that don't directly impact you, because I think you need to know the, the bigger context. Here's some of the bigger context. It comes from Wyoming, uh, through Montana, through Idaho, through Washington. The, the trains that call it are so heavy they can't go over the pass. Uh, these are, uh, I'm, I'm learning to think in metric, 1.6 miles, about two and a half kilometers long. They're so heavy that if they, if, they, if they flip on the brakes and try to stop it, if there's something in the way, a deer, a person, they can't stop for a mile. And so the engineer may want to try to stop, but they can't. A young mother was killed in our community a few years ago. A young woman was killed in White Rock just a few weeks ago in exactly that circumstance. So there are some inherent things as they increase the rail traffic that, that are, that are going to be uh, unavoidable consequences. Uh, so that's part of the, the trip, but it, it goes up the coast. Uh, they want to build a, a, a very large plant uh, to transport this out of the country in, in my community. It's worse where we're at than it would be for you. There's 50 million tons they want to export through my community. 50 million tons every year. To do that, they'd have to bring a train through my community every hour of the day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And uh, those trains would be, you know, 1.6 to two and a half kilometers long. Um, you can hear the difference. They, they bring some of those trains through now, and I don't have to look to see because I can hear very far away the difference because the trains are so heavy, they squeal. The metal on metal wheel and, and rail squeals and makes a very loud noise. Um, I think one of the most disturbing things that's happened to me so far is my son and I were reading a book, The Hobbit, and, and, and the other books, they're four books long, and it took us two years to read the whole books. He's nine. And, uh, and we were just a few pages from the end. We have maybe one or maybe two nights reading still to do, and this whole two years of reading in all four books, and it was late at night, and we were quiet, and he was snuggled in his bed, and, the, and we just closed the book, and, and a coal train was coming. You could hear it, and it came closer, and we sat there, and a very warm, loving situation. But my son looked up at me and he said, Dad, is that train from Mordor? Um, what would he say? I mean, it is. And it's going to Mordor, too. And we're just those little hobbits along the way. Um, so, it's a bigger picture, 
And uh, the rest of the picture also impacts me some personally because the, the, it comes from Wyoming and Montana, comes here, and then it's shipped across the, the, the sea to primarily China, but also India, Korea. And uh, recently my, my wife went, is Chinese and she went back home. And she went home because her elders uh, had some serious health problems. She had an aunt that had her stomach removed from stomach cancer. At the same time, she had an uncle that had uh, uh, endotracheal cancer and he had to have his, uh, he could no longer breathe nor could he eat, so he had to have a tube in his nose to feed and a, and a hole in it, here in his neck to breathe. And her other uncle, uh, a few months before, had, had a, a stroke and died. Um, in China, um, as bad as things may seem in our society, people live longer every year, overall. Their, their life expectancy is, is greater. Uh, and the only thing that disturbs that balance is actually uh, wars. When wars happen, life expectancy goes down. But in every other situation, it goes up, except recently in China. In southern China, in the urbanized areas, life expectancy was documented to go down by five and a half years. The reason there's coal to export to China is that we are refusing to burn it in America. They will close the last coal-fired power plant in Washington State within a year or so. Um, many of the fire, coal-fired power plants are being closed all over the country. And that's generated about a, a, a hundred and to 120 million ton excess capacity of coal. And so they have this coal and they'd like to sell it. And there's a market in China for buying it where they, where they will pay even higher prices than we pay here. And it's interesting because when you step back from it and think about it, America, the United States, uh, has become a natural resource colony of China. <laughs> I mean, they come and extract resources here and, and a few people here make a lot of money and all the rest of us pay the price. Now, the U.S. has been doing this to other countries, and, other, and, and every country does it to its aboriginal people. That's how it works. That's how it's worked for millennia. But it's a little sobering to think of the United States as a natural resource colony of China. But honestly, that's what's going on. And the benefits of, uh, of the people here are, are very minimal. I mean, we're just, we just the conveyor belt and the coal falling off, I'll tell you what some of the consequences may be, but they're not inconsequential for being along the conveyor belt. But those impacts in China are substantial. We'd like to think, well, that's, that's in China, right? It's got nothing to do with us. Uh, the lake that, that I get my water out, that I drink out of, and my wife drinks out of, and my son drinks out of every day is Lake Whatcom. It's a, it's a large lake near Bellingham. And there was some testing done recently, and well, about 10 years ago, and, and they discovered that the fish in Lake Whatcom had mercury in them. And that the mercury levels were so high that it wasn't safe for childbearing age women or young children to consume the fish from that lake. And, and that was, so there was a fish advisory put up and there's signs all around the lake, don't eat the fish out of the lake. And then some people from, from uh, um, the federal government came and they tried to figure out, well, where's it coming from? Let's stop it. You know, let's move upstream and get rid of that problem. And what they found was that, because you can speciate it, but now with modern science, you can figure out exactly where, where the mercury came from, because they have a fingerprint, kind of a biological and uh, metallurgic fingerprint on it. Um, and uh, what they found was 15 to 30 percent of it comes from China. When they burn the coal there, it goes up in the upper atmosphere and that mercury comes back. And about 15 to 30% of the depositional mercury in Lake Whatcom actually comes from Chinese coal-fired power plants. Now you could say, how could that be? Well, there are 1.3 billion people in China. They build a new coal-fired power plant every week. Now they know it's a problem there, but it isn't just their problem because that comes, the more we send there, the more that's gonna come back here. Um, so it's not just a problem in China, although it is a problem for those people, and we need to care about those people. Um, in, these are the proposed additional export plants. Uh, as you can see, 128, oh, thank you very much, 128 million tons of capacity, and that's what we're not using in the U.S., that's what's proposed to be exported to Asia. 
And you can see where it's, they plan on it coming from, you know, for Oregon, a couple places in Washington, and then four places in, in, uh, in BC. Um, and uh, the one that, that this particular effort is associated with is the, the Port Metro one in Surrey, BC, you know, eight million tons. Not very much in the overall big picture, is it? But what I can tell you is that once these things get established, it's my belief that the project on Texada is not about eight million tons of coal. Uh, the ones, several of them in Washington have already been stopped. There were six proposed ones. Only three of them remain even proposals, and I think we're going to stop all of them. That means there's going to be a desire to export many millions of tons of coal from other places. And so my concern is that it isn't about 8 million tons, it's about 60 million tons potentially coming to Texada. And as you know, Texada has been kind of zoned, if you will, special, especially. It, it doesn't have the protections of the other islands in, in your provincial and federal plans. It's basically been a write-off for industry. And so there are very few protections about the quality uh, of the, the land and the water and, and less concern about the impacts on the people there because of that. But that doesn't mean, particularly as, as the the people responsible for this land. This is your land and we're guests. And how long is that going to be true? That's going to be true forever. White folks are, are nomads. We wander. <laughs> we despoil a place, we move someplace else. We get tired of a place, we move someplace else. It's not true for, for native people. This, they call this ground sacred for a reason. It is their mother. It is the source of their life. It's simply true. And that's hard for non-native people to even understand. They have a problem, they move on. <laughs> um, so I'm concerned that, yeah, that's 8 million tons but, uh, annually, but I, my concern is that that's not going to be what happens. And once it's established and starts happening, I think you're going to see a lot more, honestly. Um, not just from the Powell River. Uh, there are plans for a number of coal mines on Vancouver Island. Uh, and this is a deep water port. I, I, would, I would be surprised, very surprised, if it didn't grow significantly beyond what's currently being proposed. Um, so I think as people look at this, they need to look at cumulative impacts. They can't look at the one isolated thing. You have to look at what's the bigger picture. Because if you don't look at the bigger picture, you won't really know what's going on. You need to know there's the potential just from Powder River Basin coal um, for 128 million tons of additional coal, but there's more coal capacity in BC, both on the mainland and on Vancouver Island. So it could be substantially greater than that. And any assessment or evaluation needs to take that into consideration. If you look at the proposal by Lafarge, you'll find that they don't want to do that. They don't want to talk about the larger context at all. And the reason is it doesn't look as good for them. <laughs> That's not shocking. Um, now, the, the biggest thing I think is that for you, and the thing I think I would encourage you to think about are the marine impacts in particular. This is the, the largest ferry in Washington State, and it's quite a large ferry. It's four, four stories high. It's, it's a massive structure. Not quite as big as the BC ferries. They're even bigger. But I want to show you, by comparison, what the ships look like that will carry the coal away from here. That's what they look like in comparison. So these ships are the largest uh, objects that that human beings have made that move. They have the worst safety record of any kind of ship because they're so large and so difficult to steer. Um, they're single hold. Those people that know about uh, oil spillage and other things, single hold is not a good thing to hear. Um, they carry hundreds of thousands of gallons of diesel fuel so that they can carry these massive loads across the ocean. This is not a good thing. <laughs> Not only that, but they create a massive amount of noise. Um, a friend of mine is a marine biologist, a very gifted researcher, and he believes that the acoustic trauma that's going on to the marine mammals in, in the Salish Sea is very substantial, that, that we're basically driving them out of the Salish Sea through that noise. This will not be good for that. Please come in and sit down. Thank you. you bet. Welcome. Welcome. Um, now, 
Lafarge and others are going to want to tell you that these are very safe vessels, that, that, that crashes are very rare and uncommon. Um, and I, would, I could believe that, except that um, in December of uh, a little less than a year ago, this is what happened at the West Shore Terminal. That ship went through the dock, uncontrolled, wiped it out. The other thing I tell you is once you start taking an interest in this and you start looking around the internet, you'll find that crashes of these large bulk vessels are actually quite common, that they frequently break in half, uh, that, that it's, it's, a, it's a serious issue, their safety. And this is something that needs to be studied before this plan is approved. It won't do you any good to, once this thing is going bigger than it is now, it's going to be harder and harder and harder to go back and unring the bell. Um, they'll also tell you that they're going to control all the dust that blows off of it, right? No dust will leave the facility. In fact, the dust isn't even there hardly, if you talk to them. Um, here's a picture of West Shore on a windy day recently. Um, that dust went for about eight kilometers, and it wasn't small in quantity. Um, now, they'll tell you this was just a mistake. You know, it, it shouldn't have happened. We've improved our water control systems. It's never going to happen again. Unfortunately, that's what they said about four or five years ago as well. Um, now, one of the first talks I gave up here, there was a man named Philip who's an inspector for the current coal port up in Prince Rupert. And I was shocked, because this, this, this is a guy currently employed in the business of expecting coal ports for the provincial government. Here's one of the pictures that he shared. I, he's got a bunch of them. I'd love, I wish I had more time, because I'd show them all to you. But that's coal on the water up in Prince Rupert. He says that basically they don't have to care, they don't make an effort, and there's coal all over everything. Um, so it's a, I guess I have a little bit of problem with the credibility of the people that are telling you don't worry. Um, and then, uh, this is a little bit unrelated, but I want to also share what energy companies often do. Here's a, a video that, that shows on TV of the, of the a project, uh, up in the Douglas Channel, and they want to bring a pipeline there, and they want to bring these big ships in, and, and this is their video of what it looks like going out Douglas Channel from their facility out, in, out into the Salish Sea, right? And it's a very well done, very tight graphic, beautiful, everything's going to be okay sort of thing. It, and, and this is what a, a map of that area actually looks like. Um, it's a little different. In fact, if, if you did that, what their graphic looks like, and you put it on this map, this is what it would look like. Now, I'll go back to the other picture. That's what it actually looks like, <laughs> okay? So these people are willing to play fast and loose with reality. They want you to believe that, that this is what the ships are gonna go through. This is what the ships actually have to go through. <laughs> um, they have a credibility problem. They're very good at hiring public relations people when they should be hiring scientists and people that know about these things. Um, now, one of the saddest stories for me uh, is, is this story. The, the, the uh, West Shore Terminal is just off to the, to the right, uh, uh, to, to your left, pardon me, to the upper left corner there uh, of, of this graphic. And this is a study that was done uh, starting in the 70s. Every decade, they would go and measure the herring that were, that were uh, there. This is a major herring producing area. And so in the 70s, that's what the herring looked like. Uh, in the 80s, that's what it looked like. They're starting to disappear almost entirely from Point Roberts. In the 90s, this is what it looked like, even less. And uh, more recently, this is what it looks like. Now, interestingly, uh, the coal port plant in my community is going there. The problem with that is that even if you assume that coal is entirely inert and has no chemicals in it, now it has a few chemicals in it, <laughs> But assuming it has none, what can happen is that dust will blow off just like in the picture from Prince Rupert, and it will settle to the bottom and it will cover the eelgrass. Now anybody that's a fisherman knows that eelgrass is important. And why is it important? That's where the herring lay their eggs. So no eelgrass, no herring, no salmon, no orca. It's a uh, it would be appropriate to think these things through ahead of time. It also turns out that that particular herring run is off cycle with all the other herring runs, and when the other herring runs have a hard time because of nature, 
this one repopulates the other ones because it's in a different cycle. So it turns out that it's a very special and particularly important herring run. Um, I gotta say I was shocked when I learned this. On the ferry, both ferry trips for me out to Texas and back were very valuable experiences. On my way out, the engineer on the ferry, a very nice fella, uh, asked me what I was doing and I was kind of going, well, I'm gonna give a talk. <laughs> he said, what about? <laughs> I said, about, about the coal, not knowing if he was gonna hit me with a stick or whatever. Um, but but he, he said, oh, I'm so glad you're doing that. He, th he thanked me six times for coming, which, which I was shocked by. It tells me that people really are concerned. But then he told me two stories going out. He said that uh, he used to work on the ferries down by Tawasson, and when he changed the air filters there, they would be coated in black stuff and they would have to throw them away. Usually here, he just takes it and bangs it a couple times, puts it back in. Uh, but there they have to throw them away from the coal dust. The second thing he told me was more worrisome, and he said that, you know, he lives down on Gillies Bay, is that how you say it? In, on Texada. And he said there used to be big, uh, lots of oysters there. Um, and he said there are almost no oysters now, and apparently he believes that it was due to the, something coming in the bilge of a ship and, and then parasitizing the oysters and killing them. And apparently there's some evidence that that's the case. But he shared that with me, and I thought that's, people get it. I mean, they understand that there are risks involved in this, and those risks can be substantial. Now, theoretically, they have to pump the bilge out 200 miles off, offshore. And he said, that seems kind of theoretical because, in fact, in, on a big wind, you can't steer these ships without, without having a ballast in there. Uh, it's not possible. So he kind of said, you know, it's good theory. I hope it happens. I don't think it can. So that was an interesting experience. And coming back just today, this very nice woman that grew up on the island uh, approached me, and she'd been to the talk I gave last night, and she shook my hand, and she said, thanks for coming. And I said, yeah. And then we began to talk, and she said, uh, she used to live right at the, where the ferry lands, and it's pretty industrial looking now. But she said when she was a kid, she'd go down there and there were sea cucumbers all over, and there were skates six feet wide and that thick, and that there were a seal colony right there. And, and it was almost with a tear in her eye that she said, now they're all gone. I, I think that the, you know, I, we really have to draw the line. When Jewel James took that totem pole across this part of our country, that was, he said, draw the line. That was his only message. Um, so, uh, marine mammals, the, the noise from these ships is substantial, and the, the, they, they don't have these fancy ear heads. I, I got to set just like that at home for when I mow the lawn, but, but the, the whales and, and the dolphins and the other animals don't have those, and they're literally being driven out by the noise that our industry makes. Um, climate change uh, is a big deal. It's kind of not our problem here, but it's our problem here. <laughs> Just like it's everybody's problem everywhere. Um, so sea level rise, ocean acidification, temperature changes, catastrophic weather. The, uh, Taylor Shellfish is the largest shellfish growing company in Washington State. And last year, I was pretty shocked by the fact that they tried to grow their shellfish and they couldn't because the ocean acidity had changed enough that it dissolved the shells of the baby shellfish, uh, the oysters, and they couldn't survive in the ocean. And they had to take them all out and grow them outside and bring the water to them and adjust the pH of it. And they're leaving our state and they're moving to Hawaii. A whole, it's a very large industry. Um, these, are, these climate change things seem theoretical and seem beyond us. And what you need to know is they're not, they're our problem. We have to own that and we have to do what we can to prevent it or else we're all in really deep trouble. Um, these kind of projects, uh, if you were to export this 128 million metric tons of coal, that would lead to 256 million tons of carbon dioxide going up in the air. Um, um, the oil pipelines or natural gas things and a lot of other things. You have to thinking holistically, thinking about the big picture. The coal isn't the only issue. We really need to make changes in, in who we are. Um, and that can be uh, working to, you know, to, to make sure that if this gets built, it's built in the safest, most environmentally friendly way and, and in the way that supports life and not, and not death. 
it also means we have to make choices. You know, my pants and, and my shirt, again today, just like yesterday, you know why I bought these? The Goodwill. Because I'm personally making a commitment to conspicuous non-consumption. I mean, I'm over it. If we keep consuming at the rate that we are, our children will not have a future. So we have to, make, we have to fight the big fights and we have to make personal decisions as well. We have to do what matters at, at every opportunity. Um, it's a picture my wife took in Hong Kong when she was there visiting her family. I mean, you literally can't see the sun. The sky is not blue. The ocean is not blue. They're all gray. In places like Beijing, uh, it's so, everybody wears masks. That's very common. Here, if the air quality index gets up to, to, uh, to 100, people with uh, pulmonary disease or heart disease are supposed to go in and lay down. Kids with asthma are supposed, not supposed to go outside and play. In, in Beijing, commonly the air quality is 300. Recently, it got up to 700 and peaked at 900, which is basically incompatible with life. So it's not surprising that they're, 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 uh, they're, they're shaved off five and a half years off their lifespan. It's a huge natural experiment, people living in soup that is not, not, not life-giving. Um, uh, you know, I'm a doctor, and I generally spend my time in a room with a patient one at a time. <laughs> and I, I do some public health stuff, and some teaching, and some research too. But I really, my job is to, is to save lives and prevent suffering. That's what I do. But when I came to understand this, I realized that there's a, if I want to really save lives and prevent suffering, I have to get out, of the, get out of that room and come and do things like talk to you folks. When, when my colleagues and I got together, we were responding to, to one doctor in town, a woman named Sarah Mostad. And Sarah's the, nothing would have happened in our community if Sarah hadn't done, done something about it. She's a, she's a lady that, that is an infectious disease specialist. But every doc in town, if their kid were sick, they would want Sarah to be the person taking care of them. If my son was still with, sick with infectious disease, I'm a really smart guy, I would want Sarah doing it. She has a PhD and an MD degree from Harvard. She's a very smart lady. She's a mom of three kids. She's still a nursing mother. Um, but when she said, I think this might be a problem, she didn't, no, no grandiose statements, no, she says, I think this might be a problem, we need to look at it. Several dozen of us docs met with her and said, okay, we're in. Most of the guys in our core group have MD degrees and PhDs. Um, and so we did what geek folks like that do. We said, let's read the literature. You know, not, not, not go rant or rave. We, we, we went to the librarian and said, go get us the literature about cold transportation and storage. What do we know about it medically? And we spent a number of months, we only met twice. But between basically nine at night and two in the morning, each of us would take a stack of these articles and we would read them and we summarize them and we share them with each other. Because we're all really busy people. <laughs> um, and we kind of expected it to be a 50-50 thing, like there are some articles on one side, some on the other, but that isn't what we found. What we found is all the articles said, hey, there might be a problem here. All of them, 400 of them. And, uh, and doctors are not prone to speak out about things. They hate conflict. They, they don't want to be in the middle. They certainly don't want to be in the limelight. They want to be seeing their patients and spending time with their family. That's, that's who they are. But these docs all began to be very concerned about this. And we went from a few dozen to uh, about 60 to 90 to 160 to 215 physicians in our community, all of whom said, this is a problem. We need to do something about it. Now, I've never seen 215 doctors agree about anything, ever. Um, but the, the literature was overwhelming. I just want to share some things with you. What we first did was we looked at some review articles, which are articles where somebody looks at, at a whole bunch of articles and summarizes them. So there were two big reviews about the potential impacts, one by the American Lung Association, one by the American Heart Association. Here's some of the findings in those o overview articles. You know, there can be uh, substantial, basically what all this says, Heart and lung problems and, and neurologic problems are the main outcomes that, that don't look good. And we didn't want to stop at review articles because you know, we have MDs and PhDs, so we went back to the original articles and began to look at each individual article and summarize it and write a sum summary of it. 
And so the New England Journal of Medicine is the most prestigious medical journal in, on the planet. Um, these articles are often published. This is, this is something out of the New Yorker magazine. This is something that's published in a referee journal. It's been critically evaluated for any, any error in it before it ever gets published. It takes six months minimum from applying until it's all full, thoroughly reviewed and ever published. Um, and so we went th through these articles and we found time and 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 time, and time again was there were potential problems. Um, and I, I could read all these to you, but it's sort of a waste of time. So we went through 400 articles and we found these basic five areas where we thought there were potential issues. The coal dust and diesel pollute both air and water, and, and both those need to be looked at. Increased train traffic causes noise pollution, delays at rail crossings, and safety on, for trains and ships. Um, <coughs> those are the five general categories. Um, it was an interesting process because like the guy that wanted to say noise, noise pollution was a problem, I said, man, that doesn't cut water. We, we, no, we're not going to, people will laugh at us if we say noise is a problem. But because we were kind of a science-based group, he brought his stack of articles and he slapped them down in front of me and he says, here's the data. And I said, no, we shouldn't do that. But I read those articles and you know what? Noise, if you wake an elder up every two hours all night long, like from the horns and the trains tooting, increased risk of cardiac arrhythmias, and increased risk of depression, increased risk of accidents. And if you look at the literature about children, and I, I took the slide out, but there's a picture of how many schools are near the Fraser Surrey docks, and there are like 14. <laughs> I mean, very close. The literature about noise in children says that their intellectual cognitive development is impaired significantly by chronic noise exposure. Um, so I kind of, I got spanked, you know, intellectually. I had to go back and say, okay, noise is in. <laughs> because it's strictly data driven. It's about, it's about what the facts are. It's not about opinions. Um, so in, in summary, you know, your breathing, your heart, and your brain can be impacted by this. Um, but not everybody's impacted the same. It turns out that, that barges, ships, and trains kind of would cut through a lot of communities. And the proximity, how close you are to that makes a difference. Um, the closer you are, uh, the, the more likely it is. In fact, it turns out that for things like trains and ships, if you're upwind from them, if, if the wind blows that dust or that, that diesel particulates your direction, it's a much worse thing. The people downwind may have very little impact. The people, uh, excuse me, I get that always backwards because I'm not a sea-going guy. Upwind is the downwind, I get it wrong. When it gets blown in your direction, it's a bad thing. And the, the, the company, does a, they want to take everybody and average it. They don't want to look at the upwind versus downwind people because it wouldn't be in their favor to do that. But we have to do that to know. The other thing we found out is that uh, some populations are impacted much more heavily. So elders are going to have a much bigger impact than, than other people. Children are going to be impacted more heavily. People with pre-existing lung or heart conditions are going to be impacted more heavily. Uh, people with uh, diabetes would be more impacted. And for some reason, women over 50 kept coming up in this literature searches at additional risk beyond other people. Um, and then the workers are the people that likely are to be most heavily impacted of anybody. I talked with the woman coming over on the ferry today, and she says her nephew works there. He's the guy that sprays the coal down. He comes home, he coughs up a hanky full of black stuff every day. And he says he'd like to quit. And he says if they get more coal there, he will quit. But those, there aren't a lot of good jobs on Texada, as you may know. He's, I'm sure, feeling pretty stuck. Um, but workers are going to be impacted probably more than anybody. And um, that's a significant thing, because then you have to choose between your job and making a living and supporting your family and your health. Not the kind of thing you'd like to have people having to choose between. And kids, uh, there's a guy that gives talks with me sometimes, Steve Gilbert, who's a, who's a toxicologist from, the, from Children's Hospital in Seattle. And he continually reminds me that, that, that kids aren't just short adults. Um, they eat, drink, and breathe more than for body weight than adults do, and the impacts of these would definitely be greater on children than on adults. Coal dust is associated in that literature review with chronic bronchitis, emphysema, pulmonary fibrosis, and environmental contamination through leaching of the heavy metals that are into the environment. Um, and you'll remember that the people on Texada Lafarge already have already been contaminating water supplies there 
with heavy metals and nitrates for a number of years and not cleaned it up. It's a, I mean, we need to look at this stuff proactively. The dust blows off uh, the trains. We, we know a lot about that, about 500 pounds per train car per trip. Comes off a, a, a train car currently. Um, they've been able to reduce that some by spraying kind of uh, hairspray on it sort of stuff to keep it off. That, that reduces it by about 15% still comes off. They could double treat that and try to make it better. Uh, in Canada, you don't allow the car to be filled up above the top of the car. In America, we heap it way up on top. <laughs> um, but these are American filled cars, so they're... And in the, in the barges, <clears throat> they say they're gonna cover it with a similar process, but nobody's ever done that before. It would be an experiment. And the wind on the sea is a little different than the wind on the land. <laughs> Um, in, in that stuff, there's mercury, there's lead, there's cadmium. There are things that none of those sound good, do they? Um, so, uh, you know, there's some bad stuff and it blows off. Diesel particulate matter is probably the worst thing. So if you live upwind of where those ships are setting, um, where, those, uh, where those trains and locomotives are, it's a, it can be a fairly bad thing. Um, Diesel particulate matter is 2.5 microns. That's when you burn up diesel, a little carbon core occurs, and the toxic metals and the other things attach to, the, uh, to that carbon core. And because it's 2.5 microns, it's actually breathed down. It not just doesn't get cleaned out in your upper airways, it actually goes down into your alveoli, down to the very deepest recesses of your lung. Yeah, sure. Interesting that you would ask. Um, so for two years, every diesel truck and car made in the United States has put out zero diesel particulates. It's the law. And it's technically achievable. Locomotives and ships were exempted. 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 The locomotives will have to, over a number of years, <coughs> eventually get there. But it's over an extended period of time. And ships, I don't think, are included at all. Um, one of the rules that I think would be very reasonable uh, would be to have all the ships when they come into dock actually plug into shore power rather than running their engine all the time. Same thing with the trains. Both of those have a, 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 a standard mode of running the engine 24 hours a day, seven days a week, never shutting it off. In large urban areas in the United States, there are now laws about having to hook onto shore power and shut the engine off. So, you know, if it comes to compromise time, and this actually goes through, that would be something I would want to see definitely occur here, is that they have to shut the things down when they're on, and use shore power. The, the, the wiggle room that they have in the States is they only have to do it if the ship was built with that capacity. And many, of course, aren't. The ships, of course... <coughs> right. Um, so that's a picture of what a diesel particulate looks like. You know, it's a very small... Uh, so people will say, well, I don't see any coal dust. Well, 2.5 microns you can't see. <laughs> so the very worst stuff, the stuff you can see is not as near as big a problem. It gets filtered out in your upper airway. And you can, the mucus catches it, the cilia brings it up, and you cough it out, spit it out. 2.5 microns that you can't see, it goes all the way into your alveoli, presses up against the alveolar wall, and it's transported into your bloodstream. Um, they actually know in excruciating detail exactly how it works. They know how those products get into your bloodstream and, and disrupt plaques and cause that plaque to rip off the inside of the, the, the intimal lining, the lining of your blood vessel, and cause heart attacks and strokes by plugging vessels. That's all understood at a molecular level. Uh, I was stunned by how much we know about this and about how bad it is. <laughs> um, we know that it causes asthma, it causes cancer, it causes heart attacks. We know that. In fact, on the 17th of this month, just a few days ago, the World Health Organization, for the first time, published a massive study that shows that air pollution is a class one carcinogen, proven to cause cancer. Um, noise exposure, I briefly mentioned this already. There's a bunch of impacts. You can see the list. Uh, um, it affects elders more. It affects kids. Um, and this is the part that's not really relevant to you, but the trains are a big deal. You can't stop them. They're noisy. Um, they will delay emergency responses. Um, that's a big deal. 
in the hospital, we work hard to shave 45 seconds off response time. So if somebody hits the door and they've had a stroke, stroke or heart attack, we do, the quicker you get it fixed, the more preservation there's gonna be in terms of that, that heart or that brain's capacity to function. And if we shave 45 seconds off, that's a real accomplishment. These trains, being as long as they are, will delay on average about eight to 10 minutes, and it could be, of course, a lot longer than that. The response of the, of the Burlington Northern down, down in, in the Lower Mainland was hilarious. They said, oh, we have a plan for that. We're gonna stop the train, the engineer's gonna get out, and he's gonna un unhook that car where the railroad uh, crossing is, and he's gonna pull forward, and then the ambulance is gonna go through, and then gonna hook the train back up, right? Does that seem sort of improbable to be effective or efficient or even possible? It, it just sounds crazy to me. I mean, I, what are they talking about? Yes. I mean, they, how stupid do they think we are? Um, but in serious, seriously, that's what they said. It's like, really? Um, but, but those kinds of delays are a big deal. And of course, actually, uh, there are crashes that kill people on a routine basis. And if you increase the, the, that, that significantly. Now, that can happen with ships too, as you all know. I mean, ships, uh, ship just ran over a sailboat down in Washington just a few days ago. Um, those things can happen too. So it's, a, it's not like the trains come in every hour, but these big ships will have additional risks. Take out fishing gear, uh, that's a very common thing. The Lummi, one of the Lummi Indian tribe where we're at, one of their big complaints, this is right in the middle of where they fish. These massive ships, and down there it's gonna be a ship every day. A massive ship that can't steer very well. And they, they have a real problem. Yes, sir. Easing them in, yeah. Well, uh, the, the effort in our country is different than here, but it's very, very similar. So the proponent has hired the largest PR firm in the world, Edelman. They're the people that, that, that were the PR firm for most tobacco industry. So they have good experience in how to sell things that can kill you. Um, they, in addition, hired five other public relations firms in Seattle. They kind of want to make sure that they're able to spin any story as effectively as they can. So about a week ago, I got a letter from the, from the person that is the, uh, the director of the Coal Alliance in BC, wanting to get a copy of all of my work. Um, it, and you know, you can't hide on the internet, so I said, okay, who is this guy? Well, he's a public relations guy. He's not a scientist. He's not even a policy maker. He's a hired public relations guy that does nothing but spin stuff. Of course he wants a copy of all the work I'm doing. Um, because what they're gonna do is try to make it look good. And they're willing to spend a massive amount of money to do that. That's why you have to, I mean, all of us, what I'm calling on you to do is a very uncomfortable thing. I'm calling on you to speak truth to power. They also sent that request to my employer. <laughs> so they, they, they know how to try to intimidate people. But since we've done a kind of science-based effort all along, I'm happy to give it to them, you know, I'm proud of it. I mean, this is science. You wanna argue about it? Great, bring it on. And, and if they can show me that I'm wrong about any of these conclusions you made, that's wonderful, because I'd rather be home with my kid. Uh, but that hasn't been my experience so far. Um, so uh, the thing that we're asking for and the thing that we asked for from the very beginning is a health impact assessment. And we sent all of our conclusions to every health department from Montana and Wyoming to BC. And there was some fruit from that. Since we've had a communications with your health officers up here for more than two years, when this came forward, they were prepared with information. So Perry Kendall, who's the, who's the uh, provincial health officer, has requested a health impact assessment. The two jurisdictional health officers in the lower mainland um, have both requested a health impact assessment, and your health officer here has requested a health impact assessment. So you'd think there's sort of consensus, right? Would it be a good thing to do? All the people whose job it is to protect your health have asked for a health impact assessment. What was the response of the port and the people that want to put this in? No, they're not going to do it. They're going to do, and, and typically a health impact assessment takes I would say 18 months. 
I think very kindly the health officers down here said six to 12 months is the minimum amount of time it would take. And you may know that the proponents said, well, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna do a health impact, we're gonna, we're gonna do a, an, an impact assessment, an environmental impact assessment, and it's gonna take two weeks. And we're gonna hire an objective, independent, outside agency to do that, which is the engineering firm that they've had a long-term relationship with, which has been uh, accused of, of not the uh, most legal practices uh, um, in the past. That, though that's the watchdog that they want to kind of objectively assess in two weeks what this m might amount to in terms of impacts on the environment, including you. Um, we all scratch at each other's back. Pardon me? Scratching each other's yeah, back. Yeah, exactly. It would be a kind yeah. interpretation. Let me, let me just finish up and we can have a discussion because I'm not far from being done. Um, you know, there are known impacts from coal dust, from diesel particulate matter, that all these things are known. What, what needs to be done is to take those things and apply them to a particular population to see who is it going to be impacted. Is it going to be kids, elders? Will it be one person? Will it be 50? Will it be 1,000? We don't know. I can't tell you that. Because you have to take this science we've developed and it has to be applied to particular populations of people. And you can do that. You can model that out and find out exactly what's going to go on. And that's what can and should be done. Um, what I know is that without a comprehensive health impact assessment that's objective and independent, you're not going to know what the health impacts are. You simply won't know. And it seems imprudent to, to go down this course that may lead to 8 million tons of coal coming every year to your community and may well lead to a lot more than that in the long run. You don't want to go down that road unless you know what the potential impacts will be. Um, <laughs> these are a series of posters that a friend of mine made. One says, uh, what are you willing to breathe? Um, how long are you willing to wait? Um, what are you willing to lose? How much noise can you take? And what are you willing to pay? Those are the real questions. What are you willing to give up to allow this to happen? That's the real question. I'd like to stop and ask if any of you have questions. <laughs>